Smells are part of our most fragile, most fleeting heritage. And that's why I want to know, I want to capture those smells. And there are things, I smelled mummies and old objects, but also a reconstruction of the perfume probably worn by Cleopatra. Cleopatra. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Now, how did you get interested in this area? Were you always interested in this? In smell. It happened um, when I was an art history student and our teacher took us to a, um, an exhibition called the Biennale in Venice. Right. And we walked in and there was this really strong spicy scent and it mm -hmm. annoyed me i thought what is this smell doing here it's really disturbing my aesthetic gaze and then i found out it was actually a work of art in itself and that got me thinking okay so smell can be art how am i supposed to deal with this as an art historian what would it smell like what was well, it it was a, a work of art by ernesto neto brazilian artist and the scent was, it consist, uh, consisted of, well, lycra bags hanging from the ceiling, filled with spices like curcuma, curry, uh, clove, uh, cloves, nutmeg, pepper, those kinds of scents. So I actually thought that the curators um, were having a dinner party or something. And then it turned out to be this work of art. And it never, uh, I, I never stopped studying smell from that moment on 20 years ago. Now, do you, do you chase different smells and do we all smell things the same? Oh, that's a very difficult question because um, most people see colors the same way because we have the same receptors, but in our noses, that, that's a different story. We all have slightly different receptors. So we all perceive smells slightly different on a physical level, but of course on a psychological level, uh, the changes are, are, the differences are drastic because lavender to me, it might remind me of my grandmother. It might remind you of a, a holiday in France. Um, so that's why we perceive smells so differently and why smells were perceived very differently in the past because of so the change me, in context. Uh, sorry, I, it's, it, just even to that point though, if, if you know, first of all, how can we even know? I always think about this. How can we even know if we're smelling the same thing? Because unless I'm jumping into your body, I don't, I don't even know what the framework is, the butt. But with your grandmother, for example, what if you had like a grandmother you loved, you might have the smell might be a fond smell, but if, if it wasn't a good experience, does the psychological relationship to the, to the event also impact the, if it's a positive or negative? Oh, absolutely. The way we evaluate smells has very little to do with the scents themselves, with their quality, so to say. It has everything to do with the, uh, the context in which we first smelled them. And if it was positive or negative, if you were frightened or you felt safe. Um, and from that moment on, your brain just remembers, it's hardwired, um, which emotion was connected to that scent. So the next time you smell it, you immediately feel that same emotion. And therefore something that's pleasant to my nose could be a stench to yours. Now, do you, um, can smell be used as a medicine? Yes, this is a very interesting question. It has been used as a medicine for thousands of years because people believed that stench was responsible for the outbreak of diseases. And of course, where there's a lack of hygiene, there is more stench and there is a higher possibility of uh, falling ill. So fragrances were thought to have healing properties or to cleanse the air, to make the air healthy. If it's fragrant, then it's healthy. And this was a belief system and that was valid until Louis Pasteur found out that not stench, but germs were responsible for the outbreak of diseases. But one, yeah, one could still wonder, um, 
if scent indeed has such a huge psychological impact on us and we know that the mind and the body um, are connected, then yeah, then maybe you know, scents can be very beneficial. You know, sometimes we see that with um, music, you know, music can make somebody who's got a, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, Alzheimer's or something not able to be with us anymore, but they can play music and it's a different way into the brain. Does, does smell, are there any indications that smell is also a different way into the brain that may be therapeutic in some way? Absolutely. And I've seen this with my own eyes. When I went to a care home and I brought some scents, not everyone responded very vividly, but there was there was this one woman and I gave her turpentine and she used to be a painter. And when she smelled the turpentine, her eyes opened up, uh, she, she started glowing. And then I wanted to take the smell sample back and, and then she was like, no, I'm going to keep this smell. And it was just marvelous to see. And, um, research uh, indicates the same. It's not just my experience. Um, apparently, smells can take us back to our early childhood and remains intact even when we suffer from uh, dementia or Alzheimer's. The only thing is that the problem is that people with those diseases also tend to have um, a deteriorated, deteriorated sense of smell. And it's very difficult to find the right scents. So it's easy to find a song. You can even find, you can find songs online. You cannot find the smell of our childhood online, right? It's, it's, it's hard. Now, um, do you work sort of as an archeologist thinking back through, you know, different periods and try and figure out how they smelled to, to sort of influence us in the present? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, I, I use different methods. I search texts, uh, primary sources, looking for smelly stuff, uh, recipes, um, nose witness reports, as I call them. And I also engage in depot sniffing sessions. So I just go to a museum and usually <laughs> They find it a bit weird when I ask, can I please sniff uh, some objects? Uh, but it's not invasive, right? I don't even touch them. So usually uh, conservators uh, think it's fine. And then I, I sniff objects from the 19th century, 18th century, sometimes even from antiquity and see if I can still recognize some of the odorants that were used. And a good example would be myrrh. Myrrh is a resin. It's mentioned in the uh, well, not mentioned in the Bible, but in the in the biblical story that's often depicted in paintings of the three magi. Uh, one of them, one of the magi or kings carries myrrh, which is uh, you obtain myrrh from a tree when you cut the bark. It starts bleeding these beautiful golden colored drops. And when you light them, uh, they start smoldering and giving off fragrant smoke, which was meant as a prayer to God. So that's the meaning of that story. But this, this substance was already used in uh, Egyptian antiquity. Very important scent for, for thousands of years, actually. Now, how do you, you know, you're smelling it, but do you have a tool which allows you to, you know, a sensor of some kind that allows you to measure and repeat the same smell? Right, capture it, capture the smell. Yeah, that is a possibility. Unfortunately, we cannot do it with our smartphones. We can easily record sounds and images, but smells, that's a whole different story. You need a huge machine called a, a gas chromatographer. And those machines can actually analyze odorants. Even if you only have a few molecules, it can uh, detect which molecules were used. But we mustn't overestimate or we mustn't underestimate our own nose. Our own noses are amazing gas chromatographers. Sometimes we human beings only need a couple of molecules in order to recognize a certain substance. Um, and I think in the 21st century, we, we really underestimate our sense of smell. 
we think we somehow lost our sense of smell. Um, you know, is there investment in smell in the same way we have investments in, in sight and sounds? Is there as much research going into smell? Yes, more and more. You could say that there's a renaissance of an interest in smell from all kinds of fields, psychology, anthropology, uh, marketing, um, history, museology, and so on. Um, and in medicine, in care, at my university, Freie Universiteit, they have developed a so-called e-nose, electronic nose, which can chemically detect all kinds of cancer. So just by analyzing the breath you exhale, the air you, you exude, uh, it can analyze it and recognize, uh, diagnose you with cancer in a very early non, very early stage and in a non-invasive way. So I think this is the future one day we'll have one of those, we can attach it to our smartphones and then talk to it and then it will know if we um, are about to fall ill. Do we take from the dogs that do that? Because you know the dogs have the incredible sense of smell in the detection of cancer, for example. So do we learn, can we learn from other animals? Like rats, you know, with, with uh, looking at landmines? Yes, they have amazing noses, but one of, one of the things, why do they, can they smell uh, things so well and um, trace tracks of, of other animals? Because they are on all fours. Their nose is close to the ground. So blindfold a human being, uh, put on headphones, uh, noise canceling headphones, lay out a, a track, a scent trail in a field and human beings can do the same thing. Mm. So yes, you can train dogs or bees. Bees are also used, but human beings can also be trained. And in antiquity, Hippocrates already um, taught his students to recognize diseases by the sense of smell. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the smell of war, you know, how do we understand the smell of war like how, if we want to understand the battle of waterloo why is it important to think about how it smelled yes wars are among the smelliest most foul smelling events in history and probably also in the present and of course terrible smells are byproducts of wars um, one of the smells that is the most horrible smell for a human being is the smell of a rotting human corpse. Um, there's a smell of leather, at least in the 18th and 19th century, and gunpowder. And in the case of the Battle of Waterloo, there was also the scent of moist earth because it had been raining for days, which caused Napoleon to lose because he really counted on his cannons, but his cannonballs got stuck in the mud. Right. So eventually he lost. But there were all kinds of other scents, intentional scents used during wars, such as Napoleon's perfume, and now known as Eau de Cologne 4711, used by many of our grandmothers. But in his time, it was used as a medicine. Because you remember, I told you about how stench was considered um, lethal even, very dangerous. So fragrances were considered healthy. That's why he carried Eau de Cologne with him. And soldiers also use their sense of smell for information. So they can, when they find a fire, campfire, they can smell how long it was ago that another soldier, uh, the enemy, was there. And in their diaries, soldiers speak about the sounds and the smells much more often than about their wounds. So those smells led to all kinds of behavior like um, uh, deserting. Uh, that's how awful those smells were. And when we think of history, we often think of 
either uh, of um, history being odorless, inodorate, or smells just being a byproduct, but, but they caused actions and behavior and emotions. And that's why it's important to study the smells. And in this case, this scent was even uh, reconstructed, historically informed and reconstructed by Birgit Seibrands, the famous nose here in the Netherlands. This and what it- Oh, sorry. How do sorry, you reconstruct no, it? Yeah, uh, you do historical research and then you look at the weather circumstances, uh, nose witness reports, and then Birgit Seibrands relied on a technique called living technology for the horses. So with a gas chromatographer, the smell of horses was replicated. And what this means is that people feel much more connected to that event, start thinking about history in terms of not just the sense of sight, but also the sense of smell. And blind and low-sighted people can be given access to this heritage that's usually only accessible to seeing people. There's something what you're saying, there's two things, but the one thing that just came to mind was if we're trying to create empathy, for example, and we are wanting people to really understand the stench of war or a refugee camp where people haven't, right? If we were able to give people that experience, like you would an AR experience, do you think we could create more compassion around the, the conditions. That was one thing. And the other thing I was thinking of is, is it a survival instinct? You know, the stench of death, do we run from it? So what, how does it impact our instincts and how we are in, in the real world or in the olden? Absolutely. Um, the smell of uh, dead human beings is the only smell that's innately, um, that we consider a stench. It's in our DNA the smell of sweat, body odor. There's such a big taboo on body odor, but we are not born to dislike body odors. We're, we learn uh, to not appreciate body odors. Um, there are some types of mold uh, that babies already react to, but also things like excrements and urine. Babies don't mind. We learn to dislike those scents. And then Priscilla, what was your other question again? Oh, empathy. So if we yes. were to, for example, you know, get <coughs> smells and then we need to kind of have other people really understand a person's living condition, right? So in the case of a refugee camp or something where there, there may not, where there's a lot of death or pain or something, like something like that. Does that, are you thinking about that in the way that Jesse was asking around medicinal, it's a compa teaching compassion or using smells as a way to understand other people's world? That's such a great question, especially since we li live in an audiovisual world and we see all kinds of suffering on television and we, we give it two seconds, we look at it and then we forget about it uh, most of the time. But if we could actually smell it, I can assure you, it would m make such a big impression. It's so, more, so much more direct, so much more representative of the horrible circumstances than an image. So I think you're right. It could uh, heighten a sense of empathy. You know, do you, do you, does Gettysburg have a different smell than Waterloo? And can you, can you, um, the, how do you replicate the stench of death without, you know, recording that somehow with dead people? Yeah. Yeah. I must say that we, uh, this was for the Rijksmuseum, we decided to not include the scent of death because it's so much more intense and repulsive than the image of death, which is already very impressive, of course. And you can simply not do that to people unless you guide them carefully, prepare them carefully, and then even put a bucket somewhere because people might get really sick. Um, Cecil Tola is a famous olfactory artist. She did replicate the smell of a, a trench uh, if in a Dresden uh, museum. And, and she, she did install a bucket there and it was necessary. Uh, but yes, every war smells slightly different. Of course, you can never know what it exactly smelled of. So that's why I always say this is a recreated smell. It's um, 
historically informed smell. Plus, you can never talk of the smell because smells are dynamic. There are all kinds of different smells on different moments during a war. But we know for sure that in many wars, eau de cologne, um, it was carried in boots and in, in cylindrical bottles. Soldiers carried it in their boots because they, well, they used it to uh, protect themselves, but also not just against the diseases, but also literally against the stench to mask the stench and feel better for, for just a minute. Do you ever find those vials of that around now? Do you ever find an actual vial? Yes, I have some that were dug up from uh, the canals here in Amsterdam. Uh, because when the bottle was empty, people just threw it in the canal. So I have some of those. Uh, this is an 18th century product. I have some bottles from the 19th century. All kinds of different versions. Even the recreated version that Napoleon had, re had uh, recreated himself or his assistant on the island of St. Helena, where he was exiled. He missed his favorite scent so much that he had his assistant do research in the library. He had a library at his disposal and then find ingredients on the island to recreate eau de cologne. He could not live without it. And then Jean Kerleo of the Osmotech in Versailles recreated that recipe because his assistant wrote it down. And that's kept in the Osmotech in Versailles, which is a uh, well, a smell conservatory, the only smell conservatory in the world. Now, what, what, um, well, did you smell it? Yes, it's slightly different. Um, and one of the most important ingredients, I asked you to uh, bring it today. Maybe listeners can also smell it. One of the key ingredients and one of the favorite scents of Napoleon was rosemary. And when you rub it, you can, well, you can perceive how intensely fresh it is. So you can almost, it's not hard to imagine how this would mask all those foul smells of war and other, and other scents. Did, did people in Napoleon's time just have a deeper understanding of smell as a, as a positive thing? Has this become a distraction in our time, you know, from, from some of these sort of very elemental, uh, you know, smell? Yes, I do believe so. Because scent was considered part of knowledge formation. And that doesn't mean that in the present, we do not use our sense of smell or do not need our sense of smell. We do we find our partners by the sense of smell. Uh, we, we know if, if a situation is dangerous um, and so on, uh, but we just don't, don't do it consciously and we don't use language. It's just a silent link to the world's smell. And when you lose it due to Corona, you suddenly realize yeah. how important it was. But in the, in the um, age of Napoleon, People were, maybe they didn't depend on their smell, sense of smell more, but they were more conscious of their sense of smell. And they needed to because they still believed that smell could kill. So you need to carefully map the smells in your world, assess them and know how to counter them with other scents. Um, the smell of fear, you know, that's like a phrase the smell of fear. What does fear smell like? Yeah, that's a thing. And uh, Birgit Seibrands also included that in the composition for the Battle of Waterloo, because of course, all these men and animals, let's not forget about the animals, were afraid. And it's actually produced by different glands. Anxiety sweat is produced by different glands. And that's why it smells different, much more pungent, much sharper. Uh, you might recognize it when you're really nervous about something, a performance, I don't know, that you smell stronger. And, and that's the reason. You know, what goes in the smell conservancy and what do you, how do you go about making a smell conservancy? Uh, well, usually 
the few people in the world uh, that may call themselves smell conservators or olfactory heritage scientists, they work with liquids. You need liquids um, with odorant compounds, fragment compounds, and then you can start mixing them, composing, composing a scent. Um, well, you can replicate an existing odor, still existing odor, and then you can do it fairly exactly. Uh, but if you want to recreate a lost smell, then of course you can never tell if it's, well, if it's a recipe, then it can be fairly similar. Plants, of course, they, their smells do change over the ages. Uh, but there are recipes that you can, you can follow. But, How do you uh, know they change over the ages? Well, they even change every season, depending right. on the weather and climatological circumstances. So, yes, the scents uh, change slightly, but not, not dramatically. But you do have to be careful that sometimes plants change name. So you read, um, you read Nardo or Spica Nardo and you think, aha, that must be the spike lavender. But no, it's the spike nard uh, today. And it smells completely different from uh, lavender. And also there are so many types of lavender. They all smell different. So you really have to know which kind of lavender uh, was meant. And it depends on the soil, um, pollution. Do you remember how spring smelled last year? You know, do, are you ever surprised by smells, uh, are you ever surprised by lost smells and wonder what the, you know, obviously you're thinking about Napoleon, so are you thinking about Greece and, you know, what the, what walking around in Greece might have smelled like and, you know, the haunting things that are past and will always remain past now? Yes, of course. Um, smells are part of our most fragile, most fleeting heritage. And that's why I want to know, I want to capture those smells. And there are things, I smelled mummies and old objects, but also a reconstruction of the perfume probably worn by Cleopatra. Cleopatra. And this was done by an Egyptologist, Dora Goldsmith. And that was pretty... <laughs> What, was it, what were some of the flavors that are in there? Two of the most important components are myrrh and cinnamon. So that means, well, cinnamon, you might be able to imagine cinnamon is very warm. It's very, it gives this tingling sensation. The color to me, I'm a bit of a synesthete, would be red, mm. very red, deep red. But myrrh, myrrh is more, a bit more smooth. And it's very, well, bitter almost, and a bit like licorice. It's a Dutch, very popular Dutch candy, licorice. Love um, licorice. Love licorice. Oh, you love it? Hey, that's rare for someone that's not from, uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, and myrrh is very deep. So if it was a musical piece, it would be like a bass or a, yeah, a, a cello with a uh, monotonous note. And then the cinnamon would be the up-tempo uh, layer in, in a musical piece. That's how I would describe uh, the perfume that was worn by Cleopatra. Now, were you, would, would that, that smell, if you put it in a bottle and put it in a store, would, would people uh, desire it now? Or is it a, a lost smell? Uh, I know it's pretty uh, popular. Um, Dora Goldsmith does workshops in which you can um, learn how to recreate these kinds of Egyptian, ancient Egyptian scents. They're very popular and the scent was also on display in several museums, also in the United States. It's called Mendesian. You know, um, the... Uh the whale you know whales uh what do you call it the the thing that comes out of a whale that becomes perfume that's uh you know em, yeah emigre 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 you know what how does that become popular i mean it seems like such a strange thing that people would choose to think like okay this is it we got to have this because at some point that was worth more than gold yeah yeah still it's still worth more than gold 
Yeah, it's incredibly yeah. precious. It's usually usually found by uh, someone walking his or her dog because the dog recognizes it. it. It wants to sniff it. It's just an ugly piece of gray, I don't know, amorphous mass. And then it turns out to be ambergris. And then this size would mean 50,000 euros. And how come, yeah, how come people started using this? It usually started as a medicine. So people take tiny pieces, use it in medicine, ingest it, um, also still believe that the smell itself was beneficial. And then they start using it in larger quantities and combining it with other fragrance substances, because it turns out that ambergris fixates other odorants. So odorants are highly volatile, especially citrus. It just wants to go. And then the ambergris tells the other notes, no, st stick here for another while, stay here. Uh, that's what it does. And it can remain there for even hundreds of years, just like resins. Resins do the same thing. Myrrh you know, does the same thing. Has, has the smell of perfume changed over the years? The, the good smells, you know, we talked a lot about the bad smells, but do the, the good smells linger? Um, you mean uh, if they remain in fashion or if yeah, they, you can they still smell them? If they remain in fashion them. or if you, if you still can, as, as much as we know about the, the bad smells, do we know the same amount about the good smells? Yes, absolutely. Um, people mention the smells that are striking, rarely the everyday smells. That's a shame because you want to know more about that as well. Uh, but the good thing about good smells is that people wrote down recipes. Yeah. And it's miraculous how the very same ingredients were kept uh, being used um, over the centuries. So still ro uh, roses, musk, now we use synthetic musk, uh, that ambergris, also often synthetic, and um, the resins, frankincense and myrrh, are still used in perfumery, lavender, but there are some scents that we started to dislike. That's very interesting. So the story in the Bible of Mary of Magdalene or Mary of Bethany, when she anoints Jesus's feet and she wipes them dry with her hair, then she uses a balm called spikenard. And this was very, very, it's still very loved in the Orient. Um, in, in, in the East, uh, shouldn't say or Orient. And when you show it to Western people, most Western people find it hideous. Mm. To them, it smells like smelly feet or carcasses. Mm. And another example would be patchouli. Throughout history, there's it's, it's popular and it's not popular, popular, not popular. Uh, in the seventies, of course, it was very popular. Uh, hippies smelled of uh, patchouli because it's an excellent uh, way to mask the smell of um, marijuana. But in the 1850s, it was already popular in the West because then women bought cashmere shawls and those were wrapped in patchouli leaves because they are insect repellers. Wow. So that the smell was pretty popular then, but nowadays... Well, pure patchouli, no, people do not uh, appreciate pure, pure patchouli, not, not in, in Europe at least. How do we get to like, you know, the scent of a woman and the idea of, you know, perfumes that were so strong to attract men. So you're thinking of, you know, in certain, um, you know, certain parts of history, historically women who would be, you know, paid for sex, prostitutes, and there's a lot of perfume and, and also the differentiation between what is a female perfume and, and a male per perfume? I um, mean, has that shifted? Like, are, are we now becoming more fluid in what we like uh, gender? Yeah, funnily, it was actually very fluid. So perfumes were not designated for men or women. Um, this started to change only in the 20th century. Perfumes for women, perfumes for men. So it's, it's very artificial. Um, what else can I say about that? You know, is it a, is this all a, a sort of a hidden history? 
to look back through to try and understand a different perspective on all these times? Is that why you, I mean, you've obviously got an incredible background and knowledge in this. Is it, is it this idea of hidden history, pulling it to the, the forefront? It is because it's not just the smells themselves that have disappeared, but also all kinds of objects that were made to diffuse smells. Um, entire city plans based on smells. The way we, the way our houses are organized, partially based on separating smells. The smell of the kitchen, the smell of the bathroom, the smell of the bathroom all um, inspired by this idea that bad smells were not healthy, good smells were healthy, so sh you should separate those smells. And that's why our houses are the way they are, many of our houses. Um, you could also think about how certain communities were connected through scents uh, or deemed um, as lower in society because of their smells uh, uh, attached to certain professions such as making leather, that was a very stinky profession. Uh, so yes, all kinds of hidden processes, not just hidden scents, but also hidden processes. You know, we hear you when you were describing a, a smell just now earlier, you know, I, it, it, it seems to me, you know, when I hear people speak about wine or, you know, the way that you have found vocabulary language to talk about smell is that something we should encourage people to do people that are listening you know because to describe a smell i would say oh it smells like a lemon well what does a lemon actually smell like you know so our, what can we do to as we kind of leave our audience with thinking about what we can do because it's i feel like you've just opened a world for us um, as, as important as it might be that I've never really been that conscious about talking about. So what would you suggest we can do to educate ourselves around, around what the work that you're doing? Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful question. Uh, I often look at history for inspiration because there were once many more words for smell. I studied the period uh, around the fin de siècle, so the 1900s until the 1950s in artistic circles and many artists, authors, but also what we now consider visual artists worked with smell and they used synesthetic terms. So what I just also did, translating it to music or colors, you can also translate smells to textures. So some smells, vanilla is incredibly smooth, but Rosemary is a bit spiky. You can also use temperatures. Rosemary, it has a very fresh quality, but also some warm uh, qualities, whereas peppermint is incredibly cool. Um, ambergris is considered very warm. Some people might even wanna um, talk in terms of personality traits. So vanilla is very friendly. Rosemary is pretty feisty. <laughs> So those are all kinds of ways to describe sense or, and what, yeah, Wonder. which reminds me, you ne never ask when you work with people for the first time with smell, never ask, what do you think you're smelling? Instead ask, what does this remind you of? How does it make you feel? Because there are no wrong answers. And then it takes you back to all kinds of memories. Do you have a favorite? To memories. Do you have a favorite memory that you got to through smell? Or a favorite yes. smell? Well, it's not even my favorite smell, but it was an incredibly overwhelming experience. When um, I was thinking about my grandmother when I was in my 20s, she had just died. And I was, I remembered her saying what her favorite perfume was, but I could not remember the smell like in front of my mind's nose. I couldn't smell it in my mind. So she, she said, it's Anais, Anais. And I bought Anais, Anais. I sprayed it on, I smelled it, and I was so moved. I thought, but this, this doesn't remind me of my grandmother. This is my grandmother. She is sitting here right next to me. I can almost touch her. So that's what's called a Proustian memory. Um, well, thank you so much. Carl, this has been incredible to, to
to learn about these things. We're so deeply appreciative of you coming on. You know. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. But may, may I ask you about your favorite smells, please? Um, I, you know, it's so hard. I don't, I, sadly, I don't have a great sense of smell, but I love roses and things like that. I, you know, there's only certain things come in really pungently, but that's one of them. You know, okay. we have a rose garden here. Oh, that's beautiful. Would, yeah. For me, it's two things. One is, I don't know, gardenias have always been, a, a just, a, I guess it takes me back to something in, in, you know, growing up, but the gardenia, it reminds me of summer and hope and the possibility of my future. Because I think when I was a little girl, we would, we would freak in a little island on the East Coast and they would have gardenias there. So when I smell those, I, I think of, it just takes me back. But I also, I also like some of the more, you know, kind of smoky, musty smells, um, which are about adventure to me. So I'll, I'll have to get back to you on what's you know, actual. I like the uh, forest smells, you know, in fall. Those always remind me of where I grew up um, back East. Um, uh, I wonder if our audience has any favorite smells yeah. or, you know, uh, uh, that, that bring them back to a memory. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yes, anyone watching, please let us know what, you know, tell us about your experiences through smell. Yeah, Caro, is there a website or something where people can go to learn more about your work? Yeah, I have a blog called futuristsense.com. So, so futurist smells, futuristsense.com. And there's also the project uh, that I've been working on called Ode Europa. So Europa, but OD in front of it, like Ode <laughs> Europa, yeah. which is a, an international project about the smell heritage of Europe. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really fantastic. Thank you so much. This was really yeah. Incredible. Thank you. Yeah. And as you develop that project, please come back on to tell us how it's proceeding, Carl. Okay. Yeah. Because we didn't Absolutely. even get to ask all the questions. I want to ask how, we, <laughs> how did we get to an odorless society and why? But that's for another day. We can ask that. Well, another. we don't want to get to an odorless society. No, but society. we become that. We become, we, yeah. that's how we have synthetic and deodorant yeah. and all these other things. It's a question for a different day. So, okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Okay. Carl. You're welcome. It's great See being you here. Soon. See you. Thank Bye. you.